Hello everyone, all you Tempest readers out there. I wanted to talk about Shakespeare's The Tempest and some particular things that are going on in the text. There's a lot that can be interpreted. Um, there's a lot of magic, romance, some wonderful language. It's the last of Shakespeare's plays and um, a lot of interesting themes come up um, just for that reason alone. But the kind of interpreting that we're going to do for this is called historical biographical criticism. And basically, historical biographical criticism attempts to view literature chiefly as a reflection of the life and times of the author. So I want to look a little bit about what was going on in England around 1610 and the King James I was ruling then. Shakespeare, being a very famous playwright um, and being very intelligent and somebody who talked with a lot of people and was very learned, educated, probably had a lot to say about political issues of the time. But unlike the United States, um, with freedom of speech, freedom of the press, if you had anything that was critical of the monarchy, um, you had to be very careful about how you presented that, how you expressed that. And The Tempest is interesting because there are um, several things that can be interpreted as a commentary on the way that James I was ruling England at that time, and again, it's in 1610. Um, so although the romance, which is the Tempest, it's the, the romance is considered a tragic comedy, that would be the genre that Shakespeare's writing in for the Tempest. Um, you know, the subject matter is supposed to be full of the supernatural and the magical. There are several metaphors that comment on England's political situation at the time. The theater, the globe, where these plays were performed and where Shakespeare enacted the role of Prospero as his final play, his final appearance on stage. The theater was subject to some censorship, um, but the theater was also a place where, if you were careful, you could take on some controversial subjects in a way that might cleverly avoid government interference. So what were some of the key issues that were dominating British politics after 1600? One of the most important things was in 1605, um, there was what was called the Gunpowder Plot. The Gunpowder Plot um, was, <laughs> I'm laughing a little bit to myself because it was a um, pretty serious plan that um, some, and it was a failed assassination attempt, but not just an assassination on one person. It was an attempt to, to wipe out all of Parliament. Um, a group, a group of English Catholics um, who were opposed to James the first plotted to kill the king, his family and most of the Protestant aristocracy in a single attack by blowing up the Houses of Parliament. And I think uh, they actually dug a hole underneath Parliament, like a tunnel, and they had all of these this gunpowder that they were going to try to blow the whole place to smithereens, but they were captured. Um, so, uh, disaster avoided. So this, um, but this is something that was sort of in the, the climate um, in, after 1600. Another key issue um, was this debate going on about the union of England and Scotland, whether or not England, um, if it was appropriate for them to take over Scotland, and, and in my opinion, they, they um, exploited the highlands and subjugated the um, resources, the territories, the lands of the Scottish people, taking away their heritage. Um, so this was a debate that was going on. 
A third very important thing happening at the time um, was a debate over the, the limitations of power for the king. They argued over um, the king's financial difficulties. Um, the government at the time was going into debt, and James again and again insisted that he possessed an absolute power. And at the time, the voice of the parliament was becoming stronger and stronger and more concerned with the damages that could be done with a king that had unlimited power. Um, you can already maybe start to see some themes emerging here in the political debate that spill over into the Tempest. And later on, we will look more closely at how that plays out in the language that Shakespeare uses. Um, before I end this first segment, um, I will briefly talk about Shakespeare's political orientation. William Shakespeare was very engaged as an intellectual in the central social and political issues of the time. Um, he was not a puppet, and what I mean by that, um, James I wasn't telling Shakespeare what he needed to write about or telling him to address certain political issues in order to sway popular opinion one way or the other. He was a free agent, so to speak. Um, but he wasn't necessarily opposed to government policy. So he was somewhere in the middle. Um, he positioned his plays rhetorically to provide a commentary and reflection on issues of interest and concern to those who went to the theater. So um, what does it mean by positioning his plays rhetorically? Well, he uses language, um, terminology perhaps, that might appear in political debates at the time, and he puts that language into the mouths of his characters. So a careful reader these days who knows the history will be able to pick up on that language um, in the way that was a little more obvious to the theater goers at the time. 